welcome to a cover story conversation with Ashwin Sanghi. Ashwin, as we all know, is an author. He's written the Chanakya Chant, Sialkot Saga, Rosabal series. In fact, uh, it's by accident, not designed, but I've got most of the books uh, on the shelf behind me, the white uh, color ones, all his. Welcome, Ashwin, to this conversation. Good to have you. And I love our conversations and meeting you. And I love your books. Always, and, you know. always, always a delight and a pleasure to be in conversation with you, Priya. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. But today, Ashwin, we're going to something which is linked a lot with your books because your books also de delve a lot into mythology. Uh, the Ram Mandir, you know, the, we are at a time when the Ram Mandir inauguration is going to happen. Uh, that's what, in fact, the entire country is talking about. And I, note, I remember you wrote something somewhere that it's more than just religion. For us, it's a sense of culture and, uh, you know, an identity for India. So can you expand on that thought a bit? Well, I mean, in the sense that, you know, I mean, that, that was actually in the context of the fact that there are so many multiple voices which are these days talking about whether this is right or wrong, uh, ah. whether whether the date is right or wrong, whether the timing is right or wrong, whether the ceremony is right or wrong. And in some ways, Priya, we are forgetting that this is what reflects the diversity of Sanatan Dharma. Uh, that we don't have one pontiff. So mm. oops, the Shankaracharyas may be important, but at the end of the day, we don't see them as a single united voice of sorts. Uh, we don't have one single holy book. We have multiple uh, sources of knowledge. Uh, we have different, completely different and altering or uh, altered uh, uh, philosophies uh, that we stand by. So in that sense, this chatter, uh, and this is what really makes so makes us so unique that this is in some senses, uh, Priya, a civilizational moment. It is not a religious moment. Uh, uh, we, are, we are talking about a country that has been inflicted thousands and thousands of wounds. I mean, today we cannot argue that Islam did not destroy many, many temples in India. And frankly, we needed to shed this political correctness uh, when narrating the past, because if we talk of truth and reconciliation, then truth and reconciliation go hand in hand. So you cannot have reconciliation without truth first. Correct. Uh, you know, you 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 have someone like uh, Sita Ram Goel who, who emitted that, that almost around three thousand temples were demolished and you know destroyed during uh, the various conquests. But uh, you know, you don't you don't need to go to you don't need to go to Ayodhya or Somnath or Kashi or Mathura, just go in Delhi to the Kuvatul Islam Mosque near the Kutub Minar. And outside there is a signboard which says that it was built uh, using the parts of 27 Hindu and Jain temples. So the fact that this happened is not lost on us. Now, obviously, we cannot try and go back in history and right every wrong Priya. It, no one is even expecting that. Uh, and that would be foolish uh, to try and take care of every wrong that happened in history. But neither can we expect that a wounded civilization will not try and repair some of the wounds. And this is where I feel that a solution must lie somewhere in between. And frankly, I would have been much happier in case this had emerged not through a court order, but had emerged through a negotiated settlement. Oh, uh, I thought you actually took my question away because I thought the court order gave it some kind of, you know, filling in a, a balm for the wounds because at least there the minority community doesn't feel that it's been rush, run over in negotiations or anything because here there is a court order and court is, you know, supreme. Yeah, but you, you, you know, uh, in some ways, uh, Priya, it baffles me to see the inability of our country's Muslims to be able to negotiate a very reasonable settlement uh, not regarding 3,000 places. Um, not regarding 3,000 places, but probably three places. Uh, because uh, those are a few key places that hold a very, very sacred and sentimental value uh, to the Hindus of this country. And sometimes I really feel that the Muslims of India have been almost in some ways hijacked by a leadership that refuses to change. 
a stubborn leadership that refuses to change. Now, of course, you you know, there are those on the left who will say that, listen, boss, the Hindus are exactly like that. I mean, you know, uh, so there will be finger pointing that happens. But what they sometimes forget is that this polarization that has happened, this Hindu consolidation, quote unquote, is in some ways a reaction to the on block tendencies of the Muslim votaries, you know. Uh, but think about this. Look at the world around us. I mean, countries that used to welcome migration from uh, from Muslim lands today are wanting to shut their doors. Uh, the rise of the right-leaning parties in Europe and the support that we are seeing for Trump in America uh, should be eye-openers. Uh, you know, Bharat in that sense, in its clumsy and messy way, has welcomed and assimilated all faiths. And in that sense, Sanatan Dharm has been all embracing. Uh, uh, I mean, today, if there is pluralism uh, mm. in Bharat, then I'm not ashamed to say that that pluralism exists because of our inherent Hinduness. Uh, now, there is, uh, frankly, a huge opportunity for the Muslims of India to, frankly, lead the way in, oh. in establishing a gentler, more flexible, an updated, a more permissive, a more tolerant, a kinder version of Islam. Remember one thing, people, mm. people are not remembering this, that, you know, it took 1400 years for Christianity to re reform. Uh, if we take the birth of Jesus, and then we take the Reformation, it was 1400 years. But we are exactly at that same inflection point in the history of Islam. Go back from the from the seventh century to now, fourteen centuries. Uh, so this is a time when I believe that that reformation can happen, and I genuinely am convinced that it is India's Muslims that can actually lead that reformation. It is, you know, for heaven's sake, if if places like Saudi Arabia and UAE can create a more accommodating version of Islam, then India in that sense is one of the most enlightened countries and Indian Muslims are the ones who should be leading that process. Isn't that because of what you said earlier, the leadership question, you know, the leadership of the Muslim community is scattered or it is being hijacked perhaps by a left that may not believe in religion, agnostic, but they are still fighting for the temple cause and feeling wounded on behalf of the minorities. I mean, that leadership painted itself into a corner. And remember one thing, uh, Priya, that, okay, today we may be looking at January 22nd and the Pran Pratishtha, but the truth is that uh, Varanasi and Mathura are not any less contentious. Uh, I mean, it's it's a well-established fact that the original Kashi Vishwanath temple was destroyed several times, with the final blow being delivered by Aurangzeb. Uh, same applies with, let's say, the Keshavnath temple in Mathura. Uh, and in fact, the greatest protection available was the uh, places of, of worship uh, Act of 1991, uh, which sort of said, okay, listen, now we can't keep on opening up everything. 1947 mm. is the magic date. And if it was a masjid, then it's a masjid. If it was a mandir, it's a mandir, right? So that was a blanket protection that happened. But now when you insist that those two or three places uh, that are of value to the Hindus, but are of no real significant value to the Muslims, when you become sort of in some ways inflexible on that, then what you are now leading to is a possible challenge, either a legislative challenge or a judicial ch challenge to the special provisions uh, uh, of the uh, Places of Worship Act, which means, in other words that you open up the possibility of disputes in hundreds or thousands of places. How does that help anyone? Good points. But uh, moving on uh, to the now the present, you know, the fact that the Pran Pratishta is taking place of uh, uh, the, the temple that is not yet complete. Do you want to wade into that controversy? The Shankracharyas have also voiced their, you know, apprehensions about that. Uh, where do you, um, you know, how do you see this? See, first of all, honestly, I would, I would like to say that uh, 
uh, the Shankracharyas are very, very important, but I wish that they had looked at the fact that this is a civilizational moment more than simply a religious one. I, I genuinely wish. Maybe, maybe it is wrong of me to say that because ultimately, who am I? I'm, I'm simply a paperback writer. Probably the Shankaracharyas know far, far better. <laughs> you are the Shankaracharya of literature. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, not, at, not at all, Priya. So, is, but, is they say that you know, that no, no, I, would, I should not be, maybe I should not be casting any aspersions on the way that the Shankaracharyas are thinking. But my understanding is, number one, there isn't a unity even in terms of them. There are a couple of them who feel that, no, this is fine. And there are a couple of them who feel that, no, this is wrong. Uh, either the date is wrong or the fact that the temple should be completed uh, before uh, it happens. But my understanding is that Somnath was not complete uh, when uh, Rajendra Babu went uh, uh, and uh, did the Pran Pratishtha there. And uh, 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 Priya, the truth is that in olden times, I mean, partly we've not had too many of these Pran Pratishthas because not too many of these grand temples have been created in our modern historical times hmm. but in ancient times mandirs used to take not not years but decades uh for construction and completion so it was very common for the garb grah you know what does garb grah mean garb grah means basically the womb the womb of the temple so right. in that sense the placement of the deity in the womb of the temple is almost like the placement of the embryo in the womb uh, and so it is not necessary for the structures around the Gargrahe to be complete because very often those structures would be completed tens of years later. But the worship of the idol would start much earlier. So I don't see it as a major problem, but I'm sure that those who are expressing their reservations must be having their own reasons that they, they have those reservations. You uh, also, you know, said uh, also it's a cultural moment in that sense. So, you know, seeing um, uh, the fact, the importance of, you know, um, uh, Ram, Lord Ram, who's an idol coming back to the Janbhumi, you know, it's been something which they have politicized it. But in terms of religious significance, cultural significance, how important is it? Is this temple? Well, I, th I think we cannot take away from the fact that, you know, I mean, Okay, when, when I say at the end of the day that this is a civilizational moment, uh, the truth is that Sanatan Dharm uh, has been under attack for centuries. Uh, and, uh, you know, partly that is because of the fact that all pagan uh, civilizations, all pagan uh, religions or practices were uh, did come under threat from Abrahamic ones. Uh, hmm. That's partly because as far as we are concerned within Sanatan Dharm, uh, you know, our, as I started out by saying, we are a no formula faith. I mean, there isn't a single church, there isn't a Pope, there isn't a holy book. Uh, you know, uh, you don't have one God, but you have 33 cotis of gods. Uh, you know, your, your path can be completely separate from someone else's. Uh, and which is what makes us in some ways very open and accommodating because even if you have the rise of a Buddha, we'll simply accommodate the Buddha as the ninth avatar of Vishnu. I mean, so we we simply absorb it into ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, when you come to the Abrahamic viewpoint, then that plurality in some ways is disappears because it espouses a singular truth for a plural world. That there is only one true God uh, and that combined with uh, proselytization actually has wreaked havoc on so many civilizations. Zoroastrianism is gone in Iran. Uh, the Mithraic uh, cults of Rome are gone. Uh, the tribal belief systems of the aborigines of Australia are gone. Uh, you know, Egypt's Ra and Osiris and uh, Horus are no longer worshipped today. Uh, where do you see Zeus and Athena of the Greeks? Uh, they are just simply uh, there in sculptures or statues. Uh, you know, if you go to South America, where are the in Incan and the Mayan gods? They are not there anymore. Uh, so in that sense, pagan systems could not withstand the Abrahamic onslaught. 
And here we are seeing a little bit of a reversal of that trend, mm. where suddenly, in some ways, Sanatan is saying, listen, we can't obviously reverse the entire trend, but we can make sure that we continue to exist. Uh, we can, uh, we, you know, I mean, I, Priya, I don't know about you, but I'm proud of the fact that we are one of the few pre-Bronze Age civilizations that still exist. So I'm only I'm looking for preservation. preservation. So for me, this, this is a moment of preservation. Is it also, you know, we are not a theocratic state, but can we say that Ram is the glue or Hinduism is the glue that is holding our country together? Or, you know, or is it just a northern thing? I'm going to come back. I just saw the time. We're going in for a quick break. But I'm going to come back and ask you. I can see you already got an answer. Quick break. Welcome back to a cover story conversation with Ashwin Sanghi. We are, of course, talking about the Ram Temple and uh, the inauguration of Ranjan Bhumi Temple and the significance it really has, uh, Ashwin, for the country as a whole. And is it just, uh, as some people say, limited only to the north and not the south? Uh, no, to, to my mind, first of all, these divisions, you know, the little that I hear, the number of Karigars who have worked on the temple are from all over the country. Uh, the the various aspects of the mandir, whether it is the doors or the deities or the sculptures or uh, what have you, they have come from different parts uh, of the country. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, my view is that, the you know, having this sort of idea that north-south uh, or, or the fact that, you know, is this mostly a Hindi heartland thing? I don't, I don't think that's true. Uh, uh, in fact, in some ways, Priya, uh, the, the, the greatest attacks were on North Indian temples. Uh, the ones that survived were mostly the ones in the South. So in fact, in that sense, the South has actually had the lion's share of responsibility of maintaining Sanatan Dharma. Uh, and probably if you talk to uh, most of the Hindus from the South, you will find that in, in some ways th their devotion is no less. Probably it is greater, you know. But yet the questioning of Sanatan Dhan comes from the uh, leader in the South recently. Is it just... Uh, I think that is more a Dravidian politics? thing, if you ask me. It's Dravidian uh -huh. politics. Uh, uh, and uh, honestly speaking, I think the way that it is looked at uh, by the ruling dispensation is that it suits us. You please go ahead. Keep on attacking because it only further consolidates uh, the the uh, the Hindu demographic in some ways. See, I started out by telling you that in some ways, Hindu consolidation, in my opinion, has been a reaction to a lot of things that are going on. And this is one of those, that the more you will attack Sanatan, uh, the more you will find that there is consolidation because Hindus traditionally have never been united. You see the differing viewpoints of the Shankaracharya. They, 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 it's, this is the point. We have never spoken in one voice. Hmm. But by attacking Sanatan, you end up causing Hindus to be talking in one voice. But the way the inauguration is being done by a political person and not a religious head, so to speak, uh, does that in any way worry but, you? But in the old days, which temples were made in the old days without a raja? Please tell me <laughs> the money was needed by the Raja, the initiative was needed by the Raja, the uh, charitable endowments were needed by the Raja. And then eventually, based upon all of that, it not only used to be the priests, but also the whether it was a wealthy merchant who had decided to go ahead and build that temple, or whether it was the ruling uh, Raja or Maharaja who had built that particular temple. And so in that sense, the involvement of the involvement of the, the, uh, the, the political forces uh, in establishing uh, the temple, I don't see it as a problem. And not only that, my understanding is that uh, Modi ji is not the yajman of that uh, particular ceremony. Uh, I, I I I can't remember exactly who uh, the yajman mm -hmm. is, but he is simply a chief guest. Yeah, but the, yeah, this the, the whole um, 
chief guest but you know being modi he is going to be uh, you know uh, <laughs> dominating the ceremony in more ways than one that is the whole issue the people have but again the emotional glue of hinduism how do you see that you know um, it's just increasing more and more of course a lot of it is because of the political fuel but it's just it's, it is an emotional feeling from within is that a sense of identity whatever we say that is our, is that a dominant sense of identity as an indian what is being a hindu oh uh... i i think see this is a this is a civilization that in some ways mm. has always given refuge you know i mean we prided ourselves on whether it was the zoroastrian refugees you know fleeing from muslim persecution in iran it was a hindu king jadi rana who gave them refuge or the saint thomas christians in kerala the first jewish refugees who came uh, to the malabar coast and uh, in recent history think about when the buddhist monks were being uh, butchered by the people's liberation army uh, india welcomed the dalai lama as well as so many buddhists uh, we've accepted so many refugees from you know bangladesh in 1971 uh, so in that sense the spirit of accommodation has always been there uh, priya uh, you know uh, absorbing absorbing and uh, unifying in some ways and probably that is what has given us this sense of what i consider to be the ganga jamuna uh tezi of our country uh and uh so in that sense you know we can we can love the music of bhimsen joshi but we you know will uh, uh, also have a zakir hussain that we equally appreciate uh or uh, we will have a a uh, rabindranath tagore tagore but we will also have a mirza galib i mean you, we 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 revel in that spirit but we do need to ask ourselves that why did this ganga jamuna tehzeeb not take root let's say for example in pakistan or why did it not take root in bangladesh and why is it that our, in our neighborhood uh, the muslim demographics uh, versus the hindu demographics changed uh, dramatically in favor of muslims to to in in some ways where the minorities in some way were driven out whereas in this country they've actually prospered and they've actually increased so we have to ask ourselves these questions we can't we can't wish them away we can't push them under the rug priya uh so in that sense i believe that what we are now seeing is a situation where we are seeing hey listen you know if pluralism is important to us then we must understand that pluralism is because of hinduness and that hinduness if it is preserved then in that in that sense we can continue to be a plural society and i'm purposely if you notice not using the word secular i'm saying plural but there are many avatar i mean uh, not avatar uh, uh, ideas of ram you know we have him as a warrior we have him as a prince we have him as uh, sita's husband in both the good and the bad you know in yes, the yes. so um, which is the dominant form of idea of ram that we see really uh, catching on in you know, that in uh, is there no one thing priya you know i mean there are 300 versions of the ramayana you know so now i mean which of those versions are you going to say is the correct one i mean in the origin uh, in the original valmiki rama and ram is a maryada purushottam uh, but he is not a deity in that sense uh, but by the time you come to the tulsi rama and ram is an avatar of uh, vishnu and he is worthy of worship uh, in the adbhut rama and it is sita who manifests as durga and she kills ravan uh then you have the dashrath uh uh the dashrath ramayan the buddhist ramayan uh in which uh, dashrath is not the king of ayodhya but he's the king of uh, banaras and uh, you know you have the jain ramayan in which it is not ram who kills uh, uh, ravan it is lakshman who kills ravan uh and, and in the adbhut ramayan sita is actually uh, born to ravan's wife mandotri uh and you know i mean ju just look at the number of variations that we have and we have never put one on top of the other we've not said that you, that my truth negates your truth you know uh and by the way the 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 stories that i am talking about are only the ones which are within india uh mm. i mean 
if you, for example, look at, okay, for a minute now, you know, when we are talking about the fact that this is not a, this is not a religious event, but a civilizational event, the world's largest Muslim country is Indonesia. And yes, but, I know where you're going. In Indonesia, they have the Ramayan Kakavina, uh, you know, where uh, they do the masked dance performances. And in fact, probably the largest number of Ramayan performances are probably done on a per capita basis in Indonesia. Uh, in Cambodia, you have a poem known as the Rimkar, which literally translates to the glory of Ram. Uh, and Cambodia is, is not a Hindu country. Again, uh, you know, uh, you have a Tibetan version of the Ramayana. Uh, uh, and uh, why are we forgetting that in Thailand, you have the Ramakian? Uh, and even today, the kings of the dynasty call themselves King Rama. Uh, you know, uh, they, uh, we've forgotten that, you know, the, uh, the capital of uh, the Thai kingdom uh, was Ayutha, derived from the word Ayodhya. Okay. Or if you okay. consider the capital, Siam, where does mm -hmm. the word Siam come from? It comes from Sham, which is the color of Ram, his complexion. Sham becomes Siam. So this was a global phenomenon. So today what we are celebrating is something that transcends religion. And there is never going to be one way of worshipping Ram. There will always be multiplicity of ways in terms of worshipping Ram because that is the essence of Sanatana Dharma, that there is no one true way. My final question to you, if Ashwin Sanghi were to write uh, about Ram, I mean, uh, say, how would you portray him? Which I, I, I leave that to my friends. I leave that to my <laughs> friend Amish Tripathi. <laughs> he has done that, but I thought you would have a... <laughs> no, I, I, I think... Uh, the, the way at least I see it is that people have, in my writings at least, Priya, I have always wanted, why do I call my books the Bharat series? Mm -hmm. Because I genuinely believe that there was an ancient Vedic arc of influence. You know, I mean, think about this. The In the Mahabharat, you have Gandhari, but where was Gandhar? Why was she Gandhari? Because she was from Gandhar. And you have a place in Afghanistan today, which is called Kandahar, derived from the word Gandhar. Hmm. You know, today the largest Vishnu temple in the world is not here. It is Angkor Wat, uh, you know, uh, in Cambodia. Uh, or for example, uh, you know, I find it surprising when I was writing the magicians of Mazda uh, to think that there were two ancient kingdoms, the Hittites and the Mitanni, who signed a treaty way back uh, in 1380 BC, and they were invoking Indra and Varuna uh, uh, in terms of their peace treaty that they signed. Uh, you know, we have we look at China as the enemy, but we forget that Buddhism went to China uh, through two Buddhist monks. And there is a there is a temple in in uh, in China called the White Horse Temple, where these these monks sat and they translated Buddhist scriptures uh, uh, for the common man. You know, so there is so much of there is so much of Bharat everywhere mm. that you look. Uh, you know, I mean, even today, uh, we have sort of, in some ways, I think we have only scratched the surface of what Bharat is, and I think in some ways the Ram Janma Bhumi Temple, the Ram Mandir, the Pran Pratishtha. Uh, you know what what is what is Pran Pratishtha Pran Pran means breath, right? I mean, right. we do mm. pranayam, the mm. control of breath. It's, uh, but in some ways, pran is way more than breath. It is the essence of life. It is the energy which sustains life. And pratishtha means installation. So in other words, it is an invitation to the deity that please come and reside within me so that I make you worthy of worship. So that people can come and worship you because they are not worshipping the idol, they are worshipping the divine energy that resides within the type, the idol. In some ways, I see this Pran Pratishtha moment as not only a reawakening of the deity, but a reawakening of Sanatan Dharma. On that note, Ashwin Sangit, thank you so much for this conversation, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. And I'm going to get back to you for more on this. But for now, thank you. Thank you, Priya. Always a pleasure.
For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.